So our first speaker, Laura Maitain from University of Missouri. Thank you. Um, I decided that I would take a moment to take advantage of a teachable moment. There was a discussion in this room this morning, there were, um, and I can't remember what the units were or what the particular um, chemical was, but it went from, let's say, 18 to 2 with some sort of treatment. And the fellow that was presenting it was felt sort of bad that it hadn't gone to zero. So in economics, since most of you aren't economists, I thought I would show you a little graph that we use with students. So there's a monetary amount on this axis and cleanup or abatement on this axis. And as you clean up, typically the marginal benefits will decrease. You know, you, you get the most bang when you're going from something sort of bad and getting it cleaner. And then, but your marginal costs are increasing. So there might even be cases where you actually get win-win solutions, where you have negative costs or benefit from doing a better job with nitrogen management, for example. But at some point, you know, your costs are going to start increasing a lot. And so the optimal amount, as long as your benefits are above your costs, for society, we should keep on cleaning up. But you don't want to go past the point where the costs of cleaning up are greater than the benefits to society. So that was my little economics tutorial to start off with. Um, mostly what I'm going to talk about today is um, a study that we did looking at organic fertilizer. Um, and it is not happy with me, but I will just do page down. No? Yeah, uh huh. Um, so basically, I um, have always been interested in manure and compost and think of it as a valuable product. And most of the work I've done has been looking at factors affecting adoption of better manure management practices by farmers. This particular study um, looks at homeowners and their willingness to purchase um, organic fertilizer. So new uses for manure can be win-win opportunities. You know, somebody gets a product they want, the um, seller, the produce, manure producer, gets um, a product sold. Um, and it can also um, improve the environment if that manure is being used in a more efficient way than it would if it was overused on the livestock producer's farm, for example. Um, so a lot of, there's a lot of interest in crop farmers in the Midwest using manure and because they recognize it's a good source of nutrients and also of, um, improved soil tilth and so on. Um, but another potential market is households. Um, and so in particularly, well composted manure can be used as an organic fertilizer. Um, and this was this photo was taken a couple days ago at Malbec's um, nursery and gardening store uh, north of town here, and um, it's a beautiful store. This is a garden gardener's paradise. Uh, but one of the things that they sell is an organic steer manure product um, for six ninety nine a bag, and they also have a natural chicken manure product, also for six ninety nine dollars in a bag. So this is, I forgot to ask them, I should have asked them which one they sell more of. But, um, so the, um, we got the data because we did a survey of homeowners in Columbia, Missouri last spring, and they were asked a bunch of questions uh, primarily because the Hinkson Creek is a 303D listed stream um, and um, 
They're trying to reduce the amount of storm water going in during st storm events and also reducing um, nutrients and so on. But I snuck in a question on organic manure um, that wasn't originally in the grant proposal. Um, so they were asked about their lawn and yard uh, management practices and some attitudes, environmental attitudes, um, and also demographic questions. Um, and so one question was whether they used organic fertilizer, and then in parentheses I said composted manure, in case they weren't quite sure what that was. Um, our effective response rate was 44%. So they, um, this is a good response rate for, for a survey. We'd, we'd like to have more, obviously, but this is um, quite good. And about 27% of people said they had used organic fertilizer to some extent. Um, you know, so we didn't ask whether they used a lot of it or a little of it. We just asked whether they used it or they didn't use it. Um, I will say that we suspect that there's a bit of bias in the uh, people who responded to the survey, that they were probably a bit more educated than the average of the population that we sampled from. Um, and they were probably also a little more environmentally aware than the average population. But you know, given the 44% response rate, even if none of the people who didn't respond use manure, that's still about, you know, 12, 13, 14 percent of people are using it sometimes. Um, so then, and, and so the logistic regression results that I'm going to talk to you about are less likely to be expect, uh, affected by the, that response bias. Um, so we looked at which factors affected adoption of the practice. And I'm going to go through those results. So the pseudo R squared value um, was about 0.225, which for scientific you know, studies sounds bad, but for things where you're actually looking at humans, this is decent. Um, and we had an N of about 620 people. Um, we constructed a knowledge variable, um, and it related to their knowledge of the fact that stormwater doesn't get treated, um, the definition of a watershed, whether they knew what that was, and linkages between what I do on my yard and water quality. And so if they sort of said the right thing to all of those, they were uh, considered to be fairly knowledgeable compared to the other people. We also used uh, answers to four questions to create a environmentally oriented kind of um, variable. Um, so there were questions relating you know, to things like improving the environment is more important than development um, was one of the questions. And so um, things about I'm, I'm willing to change what I do on my lawn to improve water quality. So that's the nature of these four questions. Um, so those with more knowledge were significantly more likely to use organic fertilizer. Those with pro-environmental attitudes were also more willing to use um, organic fertilizer. Um, if they indicated that they trusted environmental groups very much, um, they were more likely to adopt than those who indicated a lower trust. So, you know, given that both of these are sort of getting at the same thing, it's kind of surprising that we have significance uh, for both types of questions. Um, we asked a question about where they got information about fertilizer um, applications. And so there were things like the lawn and garden center, uh, lawn care companies, extension professionals, um, uh, and the internet and a few, a couple others. Um, but the only one that was significantly different from um, getting it from professionals or extension was the internet. So they were much more likely, um, people who, who um, 
got in their information from the internet versus professionals or the extension were more likely to use organic fertilizer. So this is where they go to get information. Um, and if they adopted other sort of environmentally friendly practices, they were also more likely to use organic fertilizer. So if they tested their soil, if they planted drought tolerant plants, or if they had rain gardens, they were much more likely to use organic fertilizer as well. Um, this is a really interesting result. And for almost all of the practices that we looked at, this is significant. So if you think about kind of a typical city or suburban lawn, you mow your lawn twice a month, it maybe takes you an hour and a half. So, you know, the, the minimal kind of a, a time you'd spend on a lawn would be maybe three, four hours a month. So we um, had several uh, categories of time and we um, combined those into less than 10 hours and more than 10 hours. So if they spent more than 10 hours per month on gardening, they were much more likely to adopt organic fertilizer. So I've been calling these serious gardeners, and if anyone else has another name that would uh, fit well, I'd appreciate it. Um, the demographic information didn't have sort of smooth relationships. So our base category was 31 to 45. Uh, um, no, actually our base category was 46 to 60. Uh, but the people in this 31 to 45 category were more likely to use organic fertilizer than the people who were um, older than this. We had another category greater than 60 years old that was not significantly different from the base category and the younger category wasn't significantly different either. Um, so there's this kind of medium age people who um, are more likely to adopt. Um, we had um, a base category for income, which includes the U.S. median household income of 50000 to 75000 And if they had um, the people who earned less than 25000 were less likely than that group to adopt, as were the people who earned more than that. So it's not kind of a luxury good, but it's also not something that really poor people buy. Um, where they lived, when we controlled for other factors, if they lived in the, the city versus you know suburbia versus out in the country near Columbia, it was all the same. There, there were no differences. Um, and you may notice in the proceedings that we said that if people applied fertilizer more than three times per year, they were significantly less likely to use organic fertilizer. Um, in the final model, um, that ends up not being significant, but it's a p-value of 0 0.14. So it's, you know, I would bet money that, you know, these people probably use it less. Um, so, uh, some conclusions, um, the users seem to be well-informed people, sort of moderate income, moderate age, um, they're serious gardeners. These are, you know, people who enjoy gardening, spend time thinking about gardening, like learning about gardening, um, and they're concerned with environmental issues. Um, Anybody who's trying to market fertilizer to these people, organic fertilizer or compost to these people, using the internet is probably a useful uh, way to access them. Um, and I would say that um, we didn't ask whether you went to, we didn't ask whether you went to um, farmers markets or not as part of the survey. But it seems like the people who sort of fit this 
package of characteristics are also the kinds of people that go to farmers markets. And you know, a lot of my friends in Colombia, you know, when I say, oh, I kind of work on manure, they, their first question is, where can I buy some? They want to know where to buy manure. Um, and so those tend to be the same kind of people that go to farmers markets and want to buy local and and are maybe foodies and, and you know, manure can actually um, provide a wide range of micronutrients and increase the flavor of things and, and so on. So um, there was uh, a group of nine farmers, turkey farmers in Missouri who formed a cooperative and bought this huge, big cylindrical composter and they put all of their turkey manure through it. And they sell a lot of it to farm their neighboring farmers but they've also started a bagging operation. And I tried to get this guy to sell at the farmer's market, but he, I don't know, I guess they sell it all anyway, so he doesn't bother. But, um, anyway, I think this would be a good thing to, um, to mar good way to, to market it. And even though, uh, I mean, you'd probably get more, you would get the money that would otherwise go to the middleman at the garden center if you sell it directly to you people in your town. Um, this is also at Molbex, and um, so they have a whole section there on natural fertilizers. The only one that really relates to manure is the bat guano here. Um, the others are bone meal and blood meal and stuff like that. Um, and with that, I will take questions, either on the survey or on economics 101. Yes. Any of them bioproducts certified USDA? Excuse me? Bioproduct certification? Um, so, I didn't ask anything about the um, type of manure that these homeowners 